Welcome to Policy Prompt. I'm Vas Bednar, and this is CG's new podcast for long form conversations with leading thinkers on transformative technologies. And I'm Paul Sampson. Vas and I will be speaking with writers, policymakers, business leaders, and technologists working across technology, society, and public policy. We'll be prospecting for good ideas and for action. What what are you really excited about with this new podcast, Vas? Good ideas only. Um, I'm excited about this gap that you and I have both kind of observed out there where we think we can do a little more to create really nice opportunities for awesome authors and, and thinkers to dig into their work and bring it to life a little bit, both for us and with us. Now, you and I are both a little bit, just a little bit obsessed with policy action and improving governance and how the right rules just make everything better. And those are some of the dots we're going to link up together as we're speaking to people. Yeah, definitely. So CG is looking to fill a gap here. And so we kind of got the two of us together here, two of the busiest (laughs) people that I can tell um, as hosts. And we're working at the coal face on a lot of different aspects of this issue. And it's going to be fun. Absolutely. To that end, Paul, I wanted to read you a little something from a new book called The Tech Coup. Do you mind? No, go for it. Okay. The digital technologies that once promised to liberate people worldwide have instead contributed to declining standards and freedoms, as well as weakened institutions. And unless democracies begin to claw back their power from such companies, they'll continue to experience the erosion of their sovereign power. Our guest today, that's the end of the quote, actually. Our guest today was first elected to the European Parliament at age 30, and they've watched tech seep into every corner of our lives. She was crowned Europe's most wired politician and called the liberal stalwart. Mariche Shaka is an international is the international policy director at Stanford University's Cyber Policy Center and international policy fellow at Stanford's Institute for Human Centered Artificial Intelligence. And she's the author of the Tech Coup: How to Save Democracy from Silicon Valley. Thanks, Vass. And Mariche also writes a monthly column for the Financial Times and serves on the UN AI advisory body. She's worked with CG before on the Global Commission on Internet Governance a few years back. That's right. But it's great to have her back. As always, uh, there's a ton to talk about, so let's dive right into it. Marie Che, welcome to Policy Prompt. So I, I was wondering, why could you tell us why is the show Suits in a book about the astounding power of technology firms? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the the anecdote about you know the choices that a Netflix or another big platform makes and how it ripples through uh, cultures and societies is just one illustration. And you know the the example of Suits, which was kind of you know on the on the B B rounds of of oh, repeat yeah. <laughs> um, until until Netflix made it cool again is you know a, a tongue in cheek kind of example of how this power plays out because in in countries like India uh, or other parts of the world where the government doesn't want to see certain content these platforms also have to make decisions about whether they want to abide by those orders and if they do they actually contribute to censorship ironically because that's often what they uh, push back against so it's it's just hmm. to illustrate how the power of algorithmic settings there's also a story about Instagram in there which you know, can can influence purchasing behavior very easily by um, promoting influencers, products on the on the home page of users when they start um, looking looking in the app. And I asked, do your engineers and and designers also think about not only moving markets but moving masses? What if mm. an influencer says, "Ugh, don't go voting; it's it's so uncool." Or what if an influencer says, "Go vote on Monday," but the vote is actually on Saturday, and if you come on Monday, you will have missed your opportunity. You know, just yeah, the civic impact, not just the commercial impact, was something that I was interested in, and um, those were questions that were just not discussed by those people designing those products. So I, I just use the examples, uh, the, the tech coup is really written with lively examples as much mm-hmm. as possible to illustrate uh, the deeper challenges of power that have really been grabbed from civic, democratic, uh, societal leaders by tech companies, large and small. 
I loved reading all those stories. It really brings all the issues, thorny issues, and kind of discomfort associated with that to life in a, in a super tangible way. Yeah, so the the book, The Tech Coup, has lots of stories and examples in there, and it's great. And that that's one of the ones that struck me early on was you talked about the Global Commission on Internet Governance that where you were working with CG. Um, and you noted this day set of meetings with academics and researchers who were kind of saying, yeah, we can we can do something here. We've got some ideas. Let's let's get a handle on these issues as they're emerging. And you, you probably you seem to be fairly optimistic at that point. And then in the evening, you had a bunch of dinner conversation with private sector and it seemed to be much different tone completely different planet and a kind of a light bulb went off for you is that is that a good description of a of a light bulb moment for you um it was just so striking to me that whereas i was known as being you know tech savvy as a politician um Vaz just mentioned being being named by the wall street journal as Europe's most wired politician. And mm, here yeah. I was sitting between really the hotshots of Silicon Valley. I mean, people that still really have powerful jobs uh, at tech companies. And I was the punching bag of the evening. I can't say it otherwise. They were just like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, here's this crazy European. Uh, and just all the cliches were coming my way. And mm. what made it interesting in retrospect, I mean, it was eye-opening to me just sort of the the arrogance, for lack of better terms. You know, I was just like, okay, because I'm comfortable with disagreement you know when you're in a parliament you disagree with people all the time it's totally fine but it was just fairly superficial arguments fairly cliche kind of approaches to you know why europeans might be might be interested in regulating tech um and it's more interesting in retrospect because actually that dinner uh was probably at one of the sort of peak moments of when silicon valley was still uh, seen in a positive light mm. when a lot of the problems had not yet surfaced, uh, certainly not to a broader audience. And so I feel like it was almost like their, you know, Titanic moment that they, that the orchestra was still playing and everything was still lavish and wonderful and that the, the sort of downturn would be coming quickly. So it's, it was interesting at the time. It was maybe even more interesting in retrospect, which is why I shared that story in the book as well. Right. Convenient guest at the right time for sure. For sure. It sounds like. It's fascinating that they you'd be both invited and then, you know, addressed with some hostility, right? And sort of observing that dynamic. Is is that around the time, that peak, when you kind of knew you had to write this book? Well, the book has probably been percolating for a long time, especially mm -hmm. after I stepped down from politics in 2019, because since then, and that's been really one of the wonderful things I've been able to do since um, stepping out of active political office, mm -hmm. I've been approached by local governments, multilateral organizations, you know, uh, presidents, ministers, regulatory bodies to think with them about what does AI mean? What does technology mean? How mm -hmm. can we regulate it? And as much as I love contributing to those discussions, I also often find myself trying to sort of start over again with analyzing what I thought the problem was in order to come up with the, the best recommendations I could make to these people in terms of what the solutions are. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm not necessarily interested in hearing myself over and over again. So I thought, why don't I just <laughs> write it down and try to shift the starting point of conversations, mm -hmm. also reaching a larger audience because not everybody is in a government, you know? So I, I hope that by, you know, taking a, a, a sharp lens the lens of power by looking at this dynamic between the private sector, the tech companies and the public interest democracy, that it will become clear that this is a systemic problem. It's not an incident and another, another uh, example of, you know, one CEO or the other. There's a lot of talk about Elon Musk um, uh, these days, but uh, the, the way in which the tech who is written really goes beyond these personalities, beyond mm -hmm. these incidents, and tries to identify this as a systemic problem of power seeping away from democratically legitimate and democratically accountable leaders and institutions into private hands. And that's a problem, and, and uh, it doesn't stop there. I also offer solutions. And so mm -hmm. hopefully... I can contribute to a shift in the conversation with a sharper focus on the fact that this is a power and a democracy problem. We are sitting down with Mariche Shaka on her gripping new book, The Tech Coup, How to Save Democracy from Silicon Valley. 
Maricha takes us behind the scenes with tech moguls, politicians, human rights defenders, and more to show how big technology firms in the U.S. have gone from innovative startups to all pervasive power brokers with very little, if any, accountability. Mariche exposes the very real danger of this Wild West environment that tech companies have grown into over the last few decades, and how that's eroded our democracy, and most importantly, what we can do about it. You can find The Tech Coup, How to Save Democracy from Silicon Valley, at your local bookstore. So when you you were um, elected as a parliamentarian in the EU uh, parliament at 30, and you were perceived, you've already mentioned it, as, a, as pro-tech in a way at that point by many. Um, is there a generational thing here that, that kind of always pits the new generation and the older generation? Like, is that... Is that still playing out? Like, is is there something about that that we're that we're always stuck with? If you mean in terms of being being used to engaging with technologies, I think maybe there's part truth to that. But I believe that at Facebook, for example, the majority are now on the older side, uh, majority of users. And uh, mm, when I was definitely. just elected, grandparents, when I was just my el- kids say, only grandparents are on Facebook. Yeah, according to my kids. Well. I'm off, so that says a lot. Um, no, just kidding. Um, but um, uh, I also think on the on the regulatory side, you can't really say that. I mean, uh, Nelly Cruz was then uh, commissioner for digital uh, affairs on the EU level, and you know she's now well in her 80s, so she would have been well in her 70s at the time, and she had key responsibility for the digital agenda for Europe at the time. So. I, I also don't think it's necessarily helpful to make this a generational thing. Uh, I also don't like the argument that I often hear, which is politicians don't understand technology. Yeah. Um, everybody has a stake in how tech impacts our society. You don't have to be an expert to voice your opinion. And the argument we don't hear so much about is whether a lot of engineers and tech executives actually are versed in the rule of law and democracy. So if we really want to go down that hole of you need to be an expert in order to have agency over things, well, then lots of tech tech uh, leaders are completely disqualified. So I would prefer to have a much more broad tent approach where everybody has a voice, everybody has a stake, and we're not going to dismiss people's concerns just because they're not experts. Paul, do you see that divide as uh, generational or th- does it sort of persist? Like, where do you see a kind of more aggressive techno optimism? Yeah, I think there is a bit of a thing there with younger kids knowing how to use more of the tools and applications and things like that's kind of inevitable right of the, but but the generational divide i would agree is not really there there yeah. there potentially is a challenge between countries though where there's a the demographics are very different and in there's a lot of data that shows the techno optimism rides pretty strong in a lot of emerging economies from from data mm-hmm. that i'm seeing so I, what the reason for that is whether it's generational or something else i think people are still unpacking Something foundational in the tech coup that you emphasize is how technology companies, big and small, but mostly, you know, the largest, the giants the, that we're maybe most familiar familiar with, have successfully resisted capital R regulation for decades. And through that, they've begun to, you know, then seize power from governments after a period of what you called benign neglect, which I thought was so captured that really perfectly. Uh, Here's a quick quote. The impact of regulatory abstention puts important norm setting powers in the hands of engineers and corporate strategists. Right. Totally, totally freaky. Were they just, were the companies just lucky or did regulators really prefer a free market at that time? And I ask you because I think it's such a fascinating circle to square because we're partially pointing to the failure of regulators while we call for smart, you know, regulation, right? The kind of the state failed us, but now we kind of also need a better role for the state. Yes, I I fully agree. So I think... Mm. Companies, tech companies took the space that was given to them, essentially. And what we've done so far in the U.S. has been laissez-faire and basically been self-regulation to date. 
you're right, it's changing now, but I would characterize it to date as being like tech companies saying, we got it, don't worry, it's okay. Uh, and I think sometimes they may even struggle with the enormous responsibility that they have, you know, being involved in geopolitical conflicts, um, you know, being threatened by dictators. Like it's not necessarily uh, the, the kind of dream uh, that, that people with laptops uh, in their garages may have, may have yeah, thought yeah, about, yeah. you know. So um, it's it's a two two way problem, and I I really do not let politicians off the hook in the tech coup. They are really, you yeah. know, scrutinized for not adopting laws, uh, for not being more clear eyed on the fact that democracy is not a self fulfilling prophecy, that it needs work, and uh, that with growing power should come growing countervailing powers. And you know mm. that whole mechanism hasn't worked for the tech sector uh, to a large extent, and. Uh, you know, the, the main responsible here are U.S. politicians, just because on the one hand, Silicon Valley is in the U.S. and is so powerful. But on the other hand, it is uh, Democratic and Republican leaders that have abdicated their responsibilities and have actually chosen to give so much power to the market. Um, to really think that a hands-off approach by uh, by government would lead to the best results, not only economically, but also politically and geopolitically. And it has simply taken too long for mm. uh, the realization to to hit home that that was a, a wrongly, wrongly guided approach. And I think Americans have paid a high price. You know, a lot of a lot of problems that we see, harms that we see coming coming from. Um, uh, you know, unaccountable tech is also hitting home in the United States. I liked how the book um, got into different presidents in the U.S. and you did, you did, you don't let the politicians off the hook by by any means, and you you are very systematic in talking about how they weighed in and sometimes how their views evolved. Was there a specific moment when we should have regulated? You know, in the past, was there kind of a crossroads? moment that we somehow missed or is this is this really kind of the boiling water and the frog like and and it's just it's just been kind of everyone was optimistic at the beginning because it was new toys but it's just kind of slowly come in and now everyone's realizing but but uh, there wasn't a crossroads was there at some point that we missed well one thing i would say and i briefly mentioned in the book although could have written a lot more about it is that there has been uh, a lack of willingness to take human rights defenders, journalists, opposition figures, civil society leaders seriously who mm. were faced with the harms of tech, whether it was social media platforms or spyware or other right. kinds of problems like Cambridge Analytica, you know, manipulating elections in other parts of the world. And so a lot of the lessons look at Myanmar where a genocidal language really, uh, you know, was was mm -hmm. steered on Facebook and led to violence. According to the Sean Youth Group Kordai Foundation, social media has been used to stoke hatred between the ethnic Sean and Palang Hill tribe. You know, manipulation of, of elections and, and Cambridge Analytica type of, of services that were used in, in other parts of the world, like Kenya, for example. You know, just those people were raising r raising uh, red flags for a long time and were certainly not heard in the United States, not getting the attention um, that they deserved. And I think there was some kind of, you know, perceived um, um, immunity from these problems in the United States, which which was naive. So I think on the one hand, not listening to examples from the rest of the world. On the other hand, um, having economic interests trump everything else. Um, and lastly, what I think is also sort of mismatch that has has caused us to be at the point where we are is a lot of the currently big tech companies started as relatively small disruptors of other established giants. Yeah. That's and right. that sort of identity and that sort of uh, narrative has has sustained while these companies grew to be incredibly large, incredibly powerful, and actually their behavior became, you know, as the incumbents being as bullish to newcomers, as anti-innovation, uh, as they were criticizing, you know, the old powers that be, the publishers, the taxi industry, and, and what have you uh, for. So 
um, the the growth has not really been appreciated for what it would lead to. And I think you know now with AI, new wave of technologies that are that are being thrown out or applications of AI, it's sort of the last tip of the pyramid of of a bunch of underregulated companies have been able to amass incredible amounts of data, incredible amounts of capital, compute, talent, you know, resources, power. And on top of that very powerful underregulated uh, position they have, they can build the next power position. And so it's, it's like a, it's like a, um, an engine that keeps turning, you know, faster and faster. It like accelerates to this point where, those that were already very powerful are becoming more powerful. And uh, mm -hmm. therefore the, the urgency that I feel to sort of break that um, excessive power on the part of tech companies, some big, some smaller um, is really growing too. A digital engine that actually is exponential in the way that yeah. it grows. Right. And so it, you don't see it. We're, we're not used to exponential change and growth. So it's something that's small one year is big pretty quickly right now in this, in this context. And I also think that the companies and, and incidents may have been seen individually, but the notion that this is an ecosystem that really also influences each other and, and supports each other um, has not been appreciated either. Policy Prompt is produced by the Center for International Governance Innovation. CG is a nonpartisan think tank based in Waterloo, Canada. With an international network of fellows, experts, and contributors, CG tackles the governance challenges and opportunities of data and digital technologies, including AI, and their impact on the economy, security, democracy, and ultimately, our societies. Learn more at cgonline.org. Picking up on that engine and that flywheel, you're very careful in the book and very direct to frame corporate leaders as, and this is another uh, direct quote, believing deeply that they can serve their users even better than governments can serve their citizens. Why do you think big tech became anti-democratic? Like, where does this undemocratic kind of audacity or superiority come from, from people who fundamentally are making and coding software. So it seems to me that a number of pioneers, but also um, entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley actually believed that what they were doing was democratic from a principles mm. point of view. Right. So mm -hmm. if you look at the whole encryption debate, obviously the idea is we are here to protect your privacy, you know, cypherpunks and all those. Right. Because the government's not going to protect you. They are mm -hmm. going to use technology for surveillance, and unfortunately, that's true. We did not expect to be in this position at odds with our own government. But we believe strongly that we have a responsibility to help you protect your data and protect your privacy. The disrespect and the sort of disdain has really come towards democratic governance and the idea that governments had any say at all. and. I think we often hear explanations. It's kind of hot again now with the uh, Telegram founders uh, arrest or CEOs arrest. I think we often hear sort of the best examples as a justification for this kind of, you know, anti-government behavior, mm -hmm. but we don't zoom out sufficiently to see what the consequences are uh, ultimately, if you look at the steady decline of democracy in the world for the past 20 years, you know, democracy is very fragile. And yes, it is great that we have phenomenal end to end encryption in apps like Signal, but that doesn't justify a hands off approach of governments in everything and anything related to tech. So it's also kind of a, you know, opportunistic use of arguments on the part of some of these tech leaders where they're happy to use the best of examples and, um, uh, discard the status quo of abuse of power by tech companies, for example, and, you know, point to the flaws of government. So it's it's also easier to hold those to account in government that are actually accountable, you know, to point to their flaws, because yes, we can do something about it. Whereas when it comes to the tech leaders, a lot of their decisions are um, not, not to be scrutinized. There are no proceedings to hold them to account. And so, um, 
I think it's it's a growing mismatch in that sense. Hmm. In several parts of the book, you talk about that challenge that that many of us face about when to engage and when not to engage, right? Whether it's an elite dinner of you know exclusive people or or um, something like Facebook's oversight board, right? Like how you know how do you decide when to engage and and when not to engage um, on on those kinds of things? It's it's always a, a judgment call. It is a judgment call, but it has really helped me to step back and really try to to look at all these challenges from the level of principles and questions of legitimacy, of uh, agency, and of uh, accountability. So let me let me try to explain. Some people have said about the Facebook oversight board, well, it's a step in the right direction. You know, there was mm. nothing and at least now there's something. I'm, you know, simplifying, but that's really an argument that I've heard quite a bit. Kayla, Facebook unveiling details of its independent oversight board is kind of a Supreme Court of sorts for Facebook content decisions. The board in a 46 page document sharing its bylaws, including that anyone who disagrees with Facebook's decision to take down their content will have 15 days to submit appeal. Uh, or there are those who say, well, I would rather have someone like Mark Zuckerberg decide rather than the government decide. But I think it's important to kind of step back and ask yourselves, like, what is a rule of law based system based on? What mm-hmm. do checks and balances look like? And not just to look at, do I like an Elon Musk or not? Do I like a Mark Zuckerberg or not? Does he serve or do they serve my club this time? Or, you know, are they fighting back against the people I dislike? I think it's Mm. really clear with Donald Trump how quickly the the tides can turn. You know, he used to um, go off about social media allegedly being against him. And now that it's actually... Uh, working yeah. out quite well for for him and, TikTok. and his uh, yeah. yeah yeah TikTok, but also also X. Um, you know, he changed his mind. This is a good example of a non-principled view. Whereas I've always said we have to worry about the outsized power of of social media companies and their leaders. What if someone comes with a very strong political agenda? It doesn't matter whether they go to the far left or the far right or anything in between. We just shouldn't want to give them this power at all. And um, I try to approach a number of questions around tech governance, not so much from is the outcome in this incident in my favor or not, or something I agree with or not, but I rather look at is this legitimate? Um, is this um, you know, appropriate in a democratic system? Are there independent oversight, transparency, accountability mechanisms? And if not, what should they look like? So just looking at it from a different level, I guess, has been uh, what has guided me in in approaching those questions of whether or not to engage or whether or not to support the idea or not. I mean, I'm curious what it even feels like to receive that invitation. I'm assuming it's uh, an email that you sort of have to have to click twice on. But soon after you declined that invitation, you kind of joyfully trolled that whole configuration with a significant effort uh, through what's known as the real Facebook oversight board. Could you tell us um, a little bit more about that work and and what you and others hoped it it could accomplish? Yes. So we need to step back a little bit. So when Facebook announced that it would set up a oversight board, um, one of the key moments um, was the 2020 election. Right? right, people were worried about how that would go, how disinformation would play out this time with all the lessons learned from 2016. Uh, but this oversight board was certainly not going to be able to hear cases or, or deliberate cases on content moderation by the time the elections would happen. Mm. And so um, a number of people came together and I was actually asked later um, when they had already decided on this initiative said, what we need is an independent oversight body. So something that's not at all linked to Facebook as its Mm -hmm. own oversight body is. And we need to scrutinize what's going to happen before the elections and not start, you know, months after because the elections were such an important flashpoint. And so that's when the real Facebook oversight board came about. And it's actually a group of 
of well-respected uh, journalists, a lot of them civil society leaders in the civil rights and civil liberties space, some academics like Shoshana Zuba, for example. And so what we try to do is to point to these accountability gaps uh, and also to to point to where accountability is is missing in a structural sense. The Facebook oversight board that it runs itself has a very limited um, mandate. It can it can sort of look in second instance at decisions about content moderation that Facebook has made, but Facebook makes many more decisions than about content moderation. You know, it has mm-hmm. groups, it talks about, or it, it decides about its algorithmic settings, it decides about data use, it decides about advertising. So ultimately its oversight board has a very limited scope, uh, mm-hmm. whereas with the real Facebook oversight board may have been, you know, launched as a bit of a humorous antidote, but it's actually dead serious in pointing out uh, where money goes during campaigns from a company like Facebook, but also how this information continues to spread, not just about elections, um, and and really, you know, looks at, at mental health issues of young people and stuff like that. So it really tries to point to the areas where there is a lack of oversight. We don't pretend that we can solve everything, but we shine a light where there's not enough of that light being shown. So there one one critical thing in your book is as you kind of transition from the the events and the way things had unfolded your observations is you start to get into okay so where do we go from here where what are you know what are the policy recommendations you're very clear in not discounting uh things due to political feasibility which i think is totally bang on you don't want to leave anything off the table or dilute advice you know before you even give it right so that makes sense um but it does kind of favor that researcher versus the policy maker right like so in in reading the book you you spend a lot of time on on the recommendations but do you, do you think there's a next step like as we unpack a few of them in a second here do you think there's a next next step required is it your next book is it should somebody else do this and kind of weave together like how how does that play out like how do people follow up on your book i guess right so I have sought to strike a balance, and this was not easy, between having been a policymaker, so really being familiar with the nitty gritty, 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 uh, which a lot of people, you know, either don't care about or just won't follow, (laughs) just check out at some point. So I tried to say somewhat high level, also reduce the amount of solutions because I could have done a hundred more, but to, to highlight a couple of approaches that could work to break the dependencies on tech uh, to increase transparency, oversight, and accountability, and to really do so directly from the perspective of, okay, this dependence, this um, power grab hurts democracy. How can we strengthen democracy? And this is really a different approach from what I also see happening, which is people hope that a side effect of other actions like economic policies or antitrust policies might be that democracy improves or Mm -hmm. they hope that Mm -hmm. data protection will have broader impact on protecting democracy and don't get me wrong i think antitrust is incredibly important i think data protection is incredibly important but i i simply think we we must address the threats to democracy head on we must Mm -hmm. identify it as the key problem and solve it as the key problem and not see it as a sort of ripple effect of other challenges or solutions and so that's what i tried to do now what needs to happen next is I would love to spend more time uh, with people or you know myself deepening and, and unpacking some of these solutions yeah. because there's a wide variety, right? Some of them are very applied and practical. Like I recommend that parliaments have an independent tech service where mm-hmm. parliamentarians and their yeah. staff can ask for advice that is not lobbied, but that is well-informed. Now, that's something that it doesn't take a whole lot of extra work. You know, a parliament can do this tomorrow. Uh, if the budget is available, they can say, yep, great idea. We're going to bring in independent te- technology expertise to improve our information position and also to improve uh, the legislation that comes out of here. It doesn't require a lot of research. I have another solution, which is much more philosophical, I guess, uh, and, and would require more developing, which is what I call the public accountability extension, which is Mm -hmm. to say, if a government or public entity 
uses technology in its name. So, for example, a police service uses technology, a tax authority uses technology, um, et cetera, et cetera. The accountability or the transparency that applies to that government agency should apply equally for for the part that's that's tech related. So it should no longer, and this happens on a daily basis, be possible for a police service to say, oh no, we did not hack the phone of this criminal. It was the tech company that did it. Or, oh, it, we had no idea that the tax authority discriminated because it was the algorithm. You know, mm. that kind of deflection or that kind of divorce between the analog and mm-hmm. the digital should simply not fly from a notion of you know, freedom of information requests of journalists or accountability to parliaments. Like if if a government wants to go to war, it needs a mandate from parliament usually. When there's a cyber attack um, or, or cyber operations happening, no such mandate exists. So it's about mm. closing that gap between the analog and the digital in, in terms of accountability and transparency. That whole idea would have so many reverberations that's why I think it's very powerful, but it would also uh, benefit from a lot of unpacking and, you know, making case studies of how it would apply here and here and here and, you know, bringing it to life in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just I want to I have to say there that that um, the risks seem to be increasing as well as you note that, you know, the power of AI is increasing the inability to potentially understand the algorithm. It It, it puts a premium on that, like the the dog ate my homework, the algorithm did it, and we don't sure. really know how or why. And sorry, you know, like that's not that's not going to fly. I wondered if there was one policy prescription or idea in particular that you think is the most radical or, you know, feels like your your wild card. Maybe you considered not not sneaking it in, into the book or you're most curious how people will receive it. Well, what I just mentioned, the public accountability extension, yeah. I think, is most far-reaching. Mm-hmm. But I was, well, I was wondering whether I should include bans. You know, mm-hmm. that's radical to say yeah. ban a certain technology. People would probably say it's impossible or she's crazy. But mm-hmm. I actually think the case can be made to ban spyware. You know, yeah. spyware is designed and actually also marketed and sold to violate people's human rights, like the right to privacy, uh, mm. but has big implications for journalists and their sources, opposition figures and their networks, the safety of people. And yet uh, the, the steps that have been taken to curb spyware have been piecemeal, they've been modest. Uh, it's a growing industry. We, we just saw uh, in recent days reports that the proliferation of spyware of the kind that NSO group with its Pegasus um, program used, has been used by Russia. No surprises there. You know, this technology does not stay in a box. It is not only to to find terror suspects or criminals. It actually proliferates or it gets abused. In Europe, we've seen uh, in Poland, spyware used against judges, against opposition figures, against journalists. You know, this is a real sophisticated tool for intimidation and for Mm. silencing and censoring people. On Monday, the Pegasus and Illegal Surveillance Committee will convene in Polish Parliament. Opponents of the previous government claim they were spied on. One is Bartosz Kramek, who claims he was illegally wiretapped due to his opposition activity. I don't think any legitimate uses, like crime fighting, way up to the way it's abused and the way it proliferates. It puts us all in danger. And it's great to see steps being taken by the US government that now bans the use of commercial spyware uh, for government. Mm-hmm. If you are uh, a business tycoon, you can probably still buy it, you know, uh, legally. Um, the EU um, has export controls that I help work on so that there's an assessment of, of human rights before a license is given. but. There are still many, many ways in which spyware is used legally and is not bound by any guardrails. Now, mm. I've come to the point where I can say, yes, it is legitimate to ban, but I'm sure people will be like, oh gosh, you can't ban technology. So, you know, those are things that I was deliberating when we, uh, when I was writing the book and when I was doing the research. That's fascinating. Thank you, Paul. I wondered if there was a, a policy proposal that similarly, you know, stood out uh, stood out for you. 
Yeah, I, I, there was. I think there. Were, I had two takeaways from those sections that I, that I really liked. One was you talked about the geopolitics of it in a way that I thought was very important and interesting. And, and if you know, this is my interpretation, but that you you kind of said that. The EU on its own is not big enough ultimately to do this. It's going to have to be transatlantic plus probably to have enough geopolitical oomph to to do something that would have a global impact, right? China will probably do its own thing. India may do its own thing, you know, but, but you need that kind of transatlantic alliance. That was one takeaway. And the other one was that if, as you just said, if you take a little bit of that framework on risk of high to low, like the... EU AI Act a little bit, like, and say there's some things that you actually might want to ban. I read it as spyware is kind of a no brainer that, like, even if you didn't use the word ban. And then there's some things that will be so minimal risk that they're not, they're just not an issue. Now, they can change too, things can evolve, but you've got that middle space where you apply the precautionary principle. So I thought when you put your stuff together, there was. A framework there that was that was uh, interesting and that was um, I thought very uh, very useful contribution. Well, that's great. I hope there's there's you know tools for many people to pick up and do something. I don't want mm-hmm. the reader to feel disempowered. There's so much that can be done, and if people have more ideas or if they say, "Well, this idea is mediocre, but I have a better idea," that's great. That's exactly the kind of response that I hope will will happen to the tech coup. I don't think anyone's going to read that chapter and think that anything there is mediocre. Uh, for me, the the element of building a public stack, you know, really resonates. You know, it strikes me that here in Canada with some of the public elements like public markets that we create, whether it's in health uh, or our expanding childcare system, we don't have public digital architecture that underpins these systems. So electronic health, electronic medical records, it's a private duopoly, you know, and then who who pays for that? Well, big surprise, you know, it's us. So having that as less of an afterthought and kind of more at the forefront, I think, you know, is definitely something I hope a lot of people and practitioners grab grab onto. So there, there has, you know, as always in the tech space, you have to check the news before you start a podcast, right, to see what happened overnight, you know, or in the last couple hours. And there have been some developments recently, and you're, you're probably still absorbing them. But one of the, the big ones was the U.S. court decision relating to TikTok being responsible for some cases of manipulating children to harm themselves and that they couldn't claim immunity from liability under Section 230 of the U.S. Communications Decency Act when content harms users. Good morning. This could be groundbreaking. For years, laws have protected social media companies from liability for user-generated content, the stuff that other people put on the platform. This lawsuit centers around TikTok's algorithm and holding the company accountable for what it promotes to users. The outcome of this case could expose TikTok and other social media companies to a wave of new legal challenges. And you talk about Section 230 a lot in your book, where do you think this impact might be going? Like, is this a big deal, what just happened, or is it is it too early to tell? What's your reaction to that, that latest news, if you've thought about it? Well, I haven't seen the details, but the, the general response would be, it would be a big deal if this immunity uh, would not apply from a legal perspective. And it also points to something bigger, which is, I think, the sense of urgency to stop this sort of unaccountable power grab uh, is beginning to really gain in popularity. Now, I'm not sure that in this case, you know, the the perspective was these are very powerful decisions shouldn't be made by TikTok. This is a very narrow interpretation as legal cases often are of whether in this case uh, the immunity applied or not. Um, But I think it points to a broader trend that people are sick of the tech rule. Uh, and if they aren't already, I hope they are. And uh, also that something can be done. It's not It's not like we have to sort of undergo uh, this erosion of democracy at the hands of, of tech companies and, of course, um, well-being of, of um, children online is not a democracy issue, but it's certainly a societal issue that should really, mm. um, you know, matter to a lot of people. And so I just hope that this is part, part of uh, the signaling that, 
that people are finding ways to push back against this unaccountable and outsized power of tech companies. And the courts are often at the forefront in in doing so, right? Or at least starting that that motion that then becomes sometimes policy driven afterwards after they kind of understand what the court was doing. In the US, certainly. And I think it's something that people in Europe often sort of miss because the courts play mm-hmm. a very different role in the United States. And they also uh, are a space to watch, particularly as the politics are so frozen and so polarized. Yeah. So while Congress is not acting the way that I think it should, um, doesn't mean nothing is happening. And similarly, on the state level, individual states are adopting really interesting laws like opt out options for uh, having your data used for training AI in California. You know, there are really interesting yeah. spaces to watch big antitrust cases against Google. Uh, so it's a, it's a very dynamic field. I just hope the different parts will also lead to a sort of full picture of what is at stake here. Mm-hmm. Part of part of that full picture has been your work looking in, at other jurisdictions and reminding us of what's happening there. As you said, not only of the best ideas, but also of challenges. Uh, you do uh, spend a fair amount of time in the book uh, looking at the, the Chinese model for Internet and data governance. Um, I wondered, you know, what you may want to convey to to listeners about that and also that the Indian model for digital public infrastructure, is that where we're seeing a kind of model or sweet spot for public-private roles or is this approach maybe creating too much uh, new risk? To start with China, um, Mm. what what is important to see is on the one hand, of course, how unaccountable power on the part of government when using mm. tech can can sort of put these harms on steroids and that's what the what the book touches on um but i also think it's important to see that states like china but also all of our states can still be very powerful if they want to be and w- what i worry about deeply is that authoritarian states have very much claimed this role in governing tech but democratic states have not and so that has an effect on you know the the harms that we face in our own societies, but it also has an effect on the ability of, let's say, a United States to negotiate with others Mm -hmm. in the world because they're not even putting a model on the table. They're not saying, hey, we propose to um, hold tech companies accountable this way or to protect speech online that way or to um, have oversight over uh, offensive operations by companies this way because they the United States currently basically has no model. And it's really hard to say, hey, let's let's build a coalition around our non-model. <laughs> um, so those are two lenses through which I, I look at this phenomenon in the book. India is unique in many ways because one, it has its own quite, you know, um, uh, own approach to governing technology with, with India stack, um, where there's... There's a lot of concern uh, of how you know that that could be uh, abused and uh, how it's vulnerable as a system. But the thinking in terms of what is digital public infrastructure certainly originated uh, there to a large extent. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. India as a country, I think, is really the space to watch because clearly Western democracies would love to count India as an ally in the big club of democracies, India is not playing ball. Uh, And it's very unfortunate, but that's the reality. Mm. And so it's a big question mark of where India will position itself. Will it become a bigger power broker when it comes to tech governance? Will it stake out a position for itself in the world? Or will its more state-heavy authoritarian behavior um, make it drift away? from a lot of uh, global efforts, certainly because of its size, it's very interesting for you know the global democratic um, balance to see where where India falls. And mm-hmm. uh, you know people in India are very concerned about the rise of China. So you know will it become a bipolar, a tripolar a tech governance a dynamic there? We'll have to see. but I, I think when we talk about tech developments and tech policy at all, there is really, broadly speaking, too little focus on India. Yeah, especially given the demographics and the growth share of the global economy that's that's generated there right now. So absolutely. 
You're listening to Policy Prompt, a podcast from the Center for International Governance Innovation. Policy Prompt goes deep with extensive interviews with prominent international scholars, writers, policymakers, business leaders, and technologists as we examine what it means for our public policies and society as a whole. Our goal at Policy Prompt is to explore effective policy solutions for pressing global challenges. Tune in to Policy Prompt wherever you listen to podcasts. We, so this segues to the big final topic, really, which is at the global level, right? That, that if a lot of the pieces can be done at the national level appropriately and need to be, right? Or even at the state level, as you were describing, um, there's always that question of, is there something needed at the global level? I think our, our view clearly is that there are certain things, whether it's, you know, autonomous weapons or, or certain risks that, you know, to, to, to society that would come from, uh, you know, somewhere, but still be a global risk. You're on the UN Secretary General's uh, AI Advisory Committee, at, and a, an interim report came out. I know there's a final report planned. Is there? Can you tell us anything about where where the framing might be going, or just you know, just anything maybe on the global context for AI agreements? Well, I believe a lot of people see the need for global agreements. Um, I personally think we would already be helped a great deal if we could see a, a authoritative interpretation of universal human rights as they apply or are at stake in digital context, not just AI, but broadly speaking. Because, you know, in today's divided world, it will be hard to get agreement around new things. It's easier to build on um, established norms such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example. Uh, and as as basic as that sounds, that effort has not been done. Uh, and I think it would be hugely helpful if it was. There's a lot of focus in our advisory body on the global south for good reason, right? The fact that the majority of the world doesn't have supercomputers. That for a lot of people, uh, it's it's very theoretical to talk about AI if you don't have access to electricity or the internet to begin with. So we must acknowledge that there are real differences in the lived realities that people have that inform how they think about artificial intelligence. And that simply rolling out AI without having a framework of rights protections or without having education or equal participation of people is going to exacerbate a lot of the inequalities that are already there. And AI is not going to be some magic wand that's going to make all those inequalities disappear. So governance matters. Uh, and ideally, this is, is global, but with a focus for the unique situation in the global south and within the global south, uh, but really with an extra effort to make sure that some of these historic inequalities are corrected and not exacerbated now with this last wave of technology. So there's thinking about that. There's, of course, thinking about um, how to create trusted resources when it comes to understanding AI. So that's where the idea of some sort of scientific panel similar to the climate um, world comes from, because there is so much disagreement within AI expert communities about, you know, what level of risk is the most urgent, within which time frames, um, what can be done practically to mitigate those risks. And so if there could be a trusted group of people that actually assesses the developments of AI, speaks to the consequences, then maybe that could simply provide a resource that many, many in the world can benefit from to make their own political decisions. You know, even if you have the same research body, people will draw different conclusions about what needs to be done next. But at least there's a starting point of facts. And I think that would be most helpful. So those are some of the directions that the, the body is thinking about. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, of course, it doesn't have to be a UN body either, even though it's difficult for the UN to say that it could be a group of like minded countries that get things started because the UN is a is a super tanker and uh, is a Tough this is true, but the advisory yeah. body is independent. So the advisory body can say anything and everything. We don't speak on behalf of the UN. We make recommendations to the UN. And I think that that makes it different from 
you know, the process of the digital global compact that's also going on at the UN level. We are not states. We are members as individuals. And hopefully that will lead to more bold and sort of out of the box thinking that is not constrained by political realities here or, or here or there. Excellent. We are so excited for people to read the tech coup, even people working in and on technology. I think that's also been a, a big shift over the past five, 10 years in terms of where where attitudes are changing and kind of the shared vision for a better future with technology. So we're so appreciative of the work and uh, we're looking forward to continuing to follow it. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to see you. Thank you, too. Something I really appreciated just of the framing of the tech coup was not, again, that title was not just how, you know, we've sort of been overthrown in terms of that that shift in, in democracy and power. But typically, you know, a coup is very sudden, right? Uh, a- ambush-like. But this coup has been incremental and kind of relentless in our lives. So that's definitely something that I'd been thinking of throughout reading the book. I loved when she said these two words and put them together. Think with, right? Framing thinking as a collaborative exercise, thinking with parliamentarians, thinking with academics, I thought was important to hear, right? It's not, the idea space doesn't have to be this competition, right? Where it's highly personalized. And I also, I mean, my policy brain really appreciated this kind of first principles. What is the problem? Like, what is the core problem we're really trying to solve? And, you know, to what extent is that related to business models? And to what extent is that related to just the practices of these firms that could be amended or, or, you know, curbed, or I wanted to use the word tamed, but maybe that's, that's too animalistic. What was sticking out for you, Paul? Yeah, I think, I think you're right that she really did get her arms around pretty much everything, right? Which is, which is what's nice in that book. It, it seems to me that like, she's such a well-informed and, and credible voice on these issues, right? Having been a parliamentarian like she knows the political side of it the realities of you know okay well what are you doing on legislation and regulations and things so she she understands that side she's she's a you know an academic she's in an academic mm-hmm. institution she understands the the rigor of the research there um and 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 she's uh a European living in Silicon Valley, which kind of interesting. Like, so she's got a lot of things going on there that make it uh, a very interesting journey that she's had and, and where she's come to. And then on the issues, she does look at the big picture. She looks at kind of the origins and and then how it fits together, whether it's the geopolitics or or these this this fairly long list of prescriptive policy mm. directions that she has. Uh, it gives a nice menu to to kind of unpack, and there there is more unpacking needed, as she said. Right now, like what would we what would we really drill into? Um, but I, I really enjoyed the the book and the and the discussion. And hey, maybe a future edition of the Tech Coup will have some of Canada's spicy policy <laughs> ideas. You know, we're often so yeah. often too often overlooked uh, in those jurisdictional scans of major yeah. activities, and maybe our policy proposals don't always completely shake things up, or we're seen as you know falling in between California and Europe. But um, that not a criticism, just an observation from me. Um, yeah, it's a really, it's a super interesting one because like Canada doesn't come up in this kind of analysis very often. But when I'm out there talking to countries wherever, they're like, we need Canada in this debate. We need Canada mm-hmm. to actually be one of the leaders because people want to listen to you. You've got some credibility. We have to make sure we actually are credible, right? Like mm-hmm. these can't be kind of just, you know, like superficial proposals and things. But I think there actually is a a strong play for Canada in in these spaces, right? And um, so hopefully we'll be stepping up. (laughs) 
Policy Prompt is produced by me, Vas Bednar, and Paul Sampson. Tim Lewis and Mel Wiersma are our technical producers. Background research is contributed by Rian Cayenne. Marketing by Kaylin Thompson. Brand design by Abilasha, Dewan, and creative direction from Sam Soy. The original theme music is by Josh Snaidlaga. Sound mixing by Francois Goudreau. And special thanks to creative consultant Ken Ogasawara. Please subscribe and rate Policy Prompt wherever you listen to podcasts and stay tuned for future episodes. Music